this is everything you should stop avoiding in your Minecraft world. Starting with organizing your storage. Now look, no one likes clutter, but way less people like cleaning up clutter, and I'm one of those. But the sad truth is that organizing your storage in Minecraft is disproportionately useful. Now I know it doesn't sound like the most enticing afternoon, but just being able to find all of your resources could save you from a lot of unnecessary search to try and find the things that you need to craft with. And the good news is that when you have an organization system that you cling to, it's a lot easier to keep in line with it. And that way the next time you go mining, you don't just throw all of your stuff into a chest willy-nilly, but you at least know that the stone blocks are supposed to go in the stone designated chest. And until you have all the iron and redstone necessary to make an automatic sorting system, I think taking the time to do this yourself is still worth it. When you're planning a big build, that's where most of your focus goes to. But as much planning and care as that takes, you should consider putting a fraction of that into the little things around it. And so just by putting in a little bit of effort to add a few bushes, maybe some lights, a pathway, you know, nothing crazy, that'll really be able to tie together your build to its surroundings. Because let's face it, it doesn't matter how cool of a base that you plan on building, if it doesn't blend well with its environment, then it just looks like you cut and paste it from somewhere else. And I'm usually in favor of stopping your builds from looking like a bad Photoshop job, but maybe that's just me. And for how much cheaper these things are to do, both in time and resources, the returns you get from them are actually pretty high. It's worth looking into. Once you beat the Ender Dragon in Minecraft, it can feel like there's no other goals to achieve, but actually the truth couldn't be further from it. And really, if you just open up the Advancements tab, you can see that there's so many goals to achieve. And maybe I'm showing my cards here, but I've actually never taken the time to go through and do all of them. And I would guess it'd be the same for a lot of you too. Now granted, some of them don't exactly sound super fun, but by taking the effort to go through this task list and do them all one by one, you get to explore parts of Minecraft that you would probably never come across regularly. And what you might find is this is a great way to make some of the more boring aspects of Minecraft into some of the most exciting when you pull them off. And even if you've done this in the past, they add new ones every update. So maybe you should check if you're up to date even. Your farms are good, but they could be so much better. Since while I get that it technically works to just plant your wheat, bamboo, and carrots in the same way, by just spending a little bit of time to automate them into a proper design, not only will your returns get better, but the time to do that chore will get less and less. And plus, I think there's just something really satisfying to the idea of just having this great of a return out of your crops. Even if it's just a simple automatic farm like this micro farm. And with things like bamboo getting a lot more useful in the 1.20 update, we're gonna need this a lot more regularly, so it's worth increasing if you have the chance. And just as it's important to focus on the details details outside of your build, you also gotta worry about the ones inside. Because let's face it, if you have a really cool looking house or base, your friend isn't just gonna wanna see the outside. They'll wanna pay you a visit too. So just by taking some of your leftover materials and stairs from the roof and using them for things like chairs, bookshelves, maybe a couple tables, even just some plants inside too, all of those really make your home feel like a home instead of an empty box in a block game. I mean, after all, you're gonna be spending a lot of time here. You might as well do yourself a service and make it an enjoyable time to spend. Insta mining with a Haste 2 beacon's a lot of fun, until you do it for too long. And then, just like every new stimulus, it gets a bit too boring, and you crave something more. But before you start using this as a gateway to the harsher stuff like TNT explosions, let me put you back on the straight and narrow and show you why this might be still worth doing. Since even if it's not technically the fastest way to get yourself the different ores that you'd like, it could still be incredibly rewarding in the different kinds of stone and building blocks that you get. Not to mention opening yourself up a large floor pan for any kind of farms or whatever that you want to build down there. I mean, do this inside of a slime chunk, and then you're killing two birds with one stone. Fishing in Minecraft is boring, or relaxing, depending on how mean you want to be. And uh, it's only gotten more relaxing ever since the changes to the treasure loot in 1.16. But while that was bad for our AFK fish farms, I think you'll find that if you go and do this outside with the right conditions, you can still use this to get some pretty useful stuff. Like if you were to enchant your fishing rod right and then go out during a rainstorm, you could have a solid shot at getting enchanted books and nautilus shells, which will put you one step further to the conduits to go live with the fish. Though after how many of the brothers and sisters that we brought up to the surface, they might not want you to live next to them. Since with enough of those Nautilus shells, we're able to build ourselves up the conduits that we can use to make our own underwater city. And while it already gets cool enough to live underwater, if you enlist the help of a couple of dolphins, you could also use this to make a really fast travel system down here. And then you not only got an underwater city, but also an underwater highway. You ever wonder why so many mobs will spawn in your Skyblock Island if you just leave a dark patch? Well, it's the same reason why you need to spawn proof all of the caves in your build. Since when there's such a limited spawnable area, it really creates an effective mob farm. And that's why, albeit boring, you should take the time to go light up the nearby caves when you're next to your farms. Folks, this could easily double, if not triple the rates that you're getting out of your mob farm. But through the help of one of the many x-ray glitches that Mojang seems to add to this game, we can use that to track down all of the caves and essentially turn our entire spawn into pieces 
peaceful mode, except for importantly where we want it to be hardcore. Then <laughs> the results get pretty wild. Ender chests are great for storing your stuff, but how much stuff you store is something you should consider. Since while you could easily just use the 27 slots that come built in, if you were to fill up each of those slots with a different candy colored shulker box, then each of those slots gets multiplied by another 27 item slots. Once you go through and name all of these in an anvil, you basically won't need a storage system at home, because now you'll have your entire gear saved up in the cloud, which can be great for when you want to go build something new far away without making constant trips back to the restock farm. Most of us like to just dump all of our resources into a chest and then only look at them when we need to. It's because you're not taking the time to compress your blocks where you can, and it's worth the extra step of just crafting all of your base resources into the blocks. Except for Nether Ward, that's a mistake that you can't undo. But for your iron, diamonds, redstone, all things like that, it's worth the couple of extra seconds. Plus, that's how you know when you're really rich, when you start counting your riches in blocks instead of ingots. Exploring caves in Minecraft's fun, I mean, it better be. But preparing to go mining down in those caves, I'm not gonna lie, it's not as much fun. Though, it's extremely important. So as much of a chore as it might feel like to get all your shulker boxes, torches, and back up on coal and wood before you go in, it really could be a necessity. I mean, even just remember to bring down a crafting table could mean that your mining session could go way longer, since then you can actually store all that raw material that you're getting inside of blocks. And that way you can keep your inventory free for the actual parts of why you're going mining in the first place, to get the rare stuff so that you can keep doing it. And then if you're only looking for specific blocks, you should just fill your inventory with those kind of materials. That way you don't have to keep throwing out stone and other junk that keeps clogging up. If it's not what you're looking for, it shouldn't have a slot in your inventory. Simple as that. When you start to uh, hire villagers into your trade, most of us will go straight to librarians and completely forget about the other ones. Maybe a toolsmith and an armor are here and there, but I think you really shouldn't be ignoring the mason villager. For just the cost of a stone cutter, one of these masons could be incredibly useful, as they'll provide you with different blocks that aren't easy to obtain, such as quartz, bricks, glazed terracotta, and after a few run-ins with a zombie, you can get those down to really crazy cheap prices too. I mean, clay isn't exactly a very fun material to get a bunch of, so just being able to save yourself the step and get two of these blocks already made for it, that's worthwhile in my eyes alone. If you're someone who likes to build, then it's obviously a lot of fun to develop your base, but spawn-proofing that base to make it usable, let's be honest, it's not the glitz and glamour of the screenshot that you get for Reddit. But also very true is that nothing's gonna make that build look even worse than if you have a creeper dive bomb you from the rafters and all of a sudden you got a huge hole and you lost your stuff. Because what you really should stop avoiding is just going around and hiding lighting underneath things like carpet and leaves. By just mixing together light sources with transparent blocks, you can make your base safe from any monster spawns and still have it look nice for the actual visitors that you want to come visit. I mean, with the changes to mob spawning in recent updates, you really have to light up a lot less. So while it's boring, it won't take you very long. And it's also a lot easier to appreciate that build of yours if you can also see it. The nether in Minecraft is annoying, but getting to the nether could be even more annoying. And not so much in building the portal, but in linking those portals up so that they go the right way. Though, as true as that is, it's also true that going through and spending the time to make a proper nether hub, and using a calculator to line up all of the coordinates for your portals right, that could save you a lot of time in exploring the nether, and also be a lot safer too. I'll be honest, I'm guilty of this one too. I spend way too much time on my server just flying in between the different portals. And all that flying means a lot more gas that I have to deal with, it's just not necessary if you're willing to spend the time to set it up right. Finding the right real estate to build your dream base is easier said than done. And really with the changes to the world generation and the world height, it's rare to come across any piece of flat land, especially if you don't want to live inside of a plains biome. So that's why it's worth it to just take your shovel and do the hard task yourself. Excavate the land, flatten it out, and you'll have the perfect canvas to start up your build. Plus plenty of temporary blocks if you need to use them as scaffolding. And plus, insta mining's just fun. So if you're willing to get your hands dirty, I think you might enjoy this one. One of the best ways to make your base come to life is to add actual life to your base. So while most of us don't want to waste our time trying to get the proper flowers and shrubbery to decorate, if you really do take the time to add some greenery and gardening around your base, it not only adds sparks of color, but it also makes it look like it's actually blending into its surroundings. And hey, you might also want to keep some of those flowers on hand for when you need dyes. There's nothing more annoying than when you need to build with a colorful concrete, and you not only need a bunch of sand and gravel, but also the dyes that you've been neglecting to get to this point. Iron farms are a great thing, but accidental iron farms, then I think we're seeing too much of a good thing in action. And what I mean by this is when you have villager breeders set up like so, where they start just spawning iron golems outside of the breeder. It's weird, it's clunky, and they don't even offer that much protection to you anyway. So most of the time, all they're doing is just policing if you're being nice to your villagers. So if you clean it up so that your villagers aren't being terrified to spawn one of these golems in, then you'll have to do a lot less cleanup going forward. And you can keep the iron golem spawn rates to where they're actually useful, in the proper iron farm. 
Minecraft's a sandbox game, so it's easy to play around with a lot of different fields. But I'd also venture that I'm not the only one who suffers from starting a bunch of little projects, and that I never go through and actually finish them up like I'm supposed to. And while it could have looked great if I actually finished this project in the first place, leaving a bunch of half-finished unanswered questions around your build, yeah, then it's not just a to-do list, it's a junkyard. And so let's take a page out of Ethos book, where every now and then you just go through and finish up the little things that you never got around to. They're not as exciting as the big stuff, but if you're able to finish a bunch of them in one go, then that could add up to being a pretty major change to your build. And if you really don't want to finish it, just get rid of it. Trust me, it'll look better than just leaving it half empty. Look, I get it. After building up your mob farm, you're very likely not looking for another chore on top of that. But if you can get around to it, taking the time to actually go through your mob farm's chest and sort out with an item filter, then you can save yourself from having to build a huge storage silo like this one and make sure that you're only getting out of your farm what you want to get out of that farm. It's a lot easier to store your stacks of bones and arrows from your skeleton farm if there's not a bunch of half-used bows clogging up the space. And the same goes for gold farms, maybe even more so. All those gold swords from the piglins? Yeah, toss those into lava or something. Or if you really want the best returns, you could have them go back into a smelter and turn into golden nuggets. But really, if your gold farm's working out all right, I think those extra golden nuggets would just be a rounding error. The most common chore that you probably avoid doing in your world is also the simplest, sleeping. Which I get it, when you're going and exploring the world and trying to look for a certain thing, you probably don't want to clog up one of your inventory inventory slots with a bed, or you don't want to lose your spawn point back at your house. But making sure to place one of these down and sleeping in it every now and then could be a big help if you don't want to deal with phantoms, especially if you're playing on a multiplayer server. It's just common courtesy. After all, I don't deserve to get insomnia just because you're trying to finish up your base. If you can spare three wool and some planks, it's the nice thing to do for your friends and you. When you're first exploring your Minecraft world, you'll want to keep this one in mind. Since while it's easy to get caught up with the structures of the rarer things that you're searching for, you should also take note to grab every single sapling type that you see. That way, when you have enough of those built up, you'll be able to build yourself a proper tree farm at your base and open up a whole new color palette of wood types that you get to build with. After all, it's pretty lame to be limited to just what's around you. So while you might not want to settle down in a taiga biome, you should grab the spruce saplings just in case. The wood looks nice even if you don't settle down there, and it'll save you from having to go travel with thousands of blocks back just to go and find one again. Sorting through your shulker boxes can obviously help out with your inventory storage, but what do you do with your project management once the project manages to finish? Well, at that point, as boring as it may seem, you should go through and take away the color and bring them back to a proper name. After all, you don't need it to be called Tree Farm 1 when the tree farm's been well and done for over a year. And I think what you'll find is that if you have these shulker boxes ready to start your next project, you'll want to start that next project. So you're not only cleaning up from the last one, but you're also also setting yourself up nicely for the next one, and I think that's pretty lovely. This one pixel can completely ruin your builds, because as soon as we convert our grass blocks into a path block, then it goes from 16 pixels tall down to 15. And with that one pixel gap of visibility, now we have to consider any blocks that are seen behind. So in this case, the proper way that we should be doing this is replacing the block that's underneath with the same block that's above it. Otherwise, our build's just gonna look unfinished, and since we went through extra effort to make sure that we even had the path in the first place, I think it's worth following through so that the rest of the build doesn't look unfinished. This TNT trap works, but we can do so much better, because by just adding five iron to the base of that TNT, we got ourselves a TNT minecart that does the job instantaneously. Since by mixing together TNT minecarts with powered rails, we can not only explode our victim before they know what's going on, but we can also pack an absurd amount of TNT into that one rail, making our machine a lot deadlier without actually having to scale up the size. You should never leave blocks missing in a place of a build where you won't see them, because even if you can't see it, you're still gonna know it's there, and you're definitely gonna hear it when those mobs start spawn in the gaps that you left. So to prevent that, it's worth filling in the gaps with something that you have on hand. Even if it's a cheaper block, that's at least gonna be better than having negative space in the open air. And that piece of advice doesn't just go for the regular builds that you're leaving on hand. Because for the same reasons, you never wanna leave your terraform terrain hollow as well. Because while this custom hill that you built might look great, it's gonna be a real shame when a couple of mobs start to spawn into that dark space. And even if you were to light it up, all it takes is breaking one block and you'll fall right through the middle of that open air. So instead, if you're going through the effort to make your hill look realistic, why not actually make it realistic and fill it all the way in? If you enchant like this, you're doing it wrong. Because as Nembon lays out, there's a way to properly use an anvil to allow us to apply more than 30 enchantments to an item. And considering there aren't 30 enchantments in the game, this basically means that we can get any enchantment that you want onto that one item without ever seeing the too expensive screen show up. And the reason for this basically comes down to a different point system that gives different values to different enchantments. But if I were to list them out for every enchantment right here, we'd be here all 
all day. So I'd recommend checking out Nembon's video to see more about how the details are done. Because while it might take a learning curve to figure out, as soon as you've got it, your tools are about to get a lot more powerful, and more importantly, you'll still be able to repair them. Why does this lava look so ugly? Well, the unfortunate problem here is that we didn't use lava source blocks for all of them. And as you can notice, cutting corners here is just gonna make for a mess. Which really is true whether you're using water or lava features, but at least water tends to fill in the gaps if you leave it for long enough. But since lava's renewable through dripstone now, I think there's no reason to leave any of your lava pools looking this bad. So if you're gonna do a job, you gotta do it right. Normally a night vision potion might seem excessive, but while you might not want to use one of these inside of a cave, you should try drinking one of these the next time you go to an ocean. Since with regular brightness settings, by drinking one of these, you can see straight through the ocean. And that gives you an easy cheap way to find things like geodes, ocean monuments, and the real kicker, shipwrecks. Which themselves can lead you to a lot of food, as well as a lot of buried treasure. And after finding enough of that, you won't have to worry about finding cheap hex, you'll be pretty well to do. On the second floor, we've got a beautiful hot tub, but on the ground floor, you're not gonna like it as much. Since the ugly truth is that only having a one block thick floor underneath a water or lava feature means that all we're gonna see from the bottom floor is a bunch of particles dripping down from the ceiling. I'd rather just make the floor too thick and not have to worry about it. Never type out this command, but instead you should just hold down the F3 key and then use the F4 to scroll through. With this simple shortcut, we don't have to waste the time typing out the command, and we can seamlessly switch between the different game modes that you might be doing while you're building a map. And if you're a veteran player, it might take a little bit to get used to, but as soon as you do, you'll never want to go back in the older versions. This is a building sin that even Green's guilty of. Since while it's easy to get excited about building up the beautiful front of your building, since after all, that's what most people are going to see, it's when you neglect the back of the build and leave it unfinished that you start to get into a problem. Now I get it, in survival mode it's easy to run out of materials to finish the job, but if you ask me, if you're only going to do half of the job anyway, then you should shrink down the scope of the build to half the size and do the whole thing. It's a lot more impressive to have a full job. Now, we've talked in the past about using moss as a way to clear through deep slate. And that's still true. With bone meal and a stone hoe, you can eviscerate the depths. But I want to add on another reason for why you should try this. Since while the moss is able to convert deep slate, it can't convert the ores. And just at that little sticking point, we're able to find the ores that might have generated down there much easier. Which is great for diamonds, considering that those have a higher chance of generating underneath other blocks anyway. So when you can instantly mine away the blanket that the diamonds are sleeping under, that'll be a lot better for your time and for your pickaxe. And not to mention that just moss by itself is a really useful block. And as soon as we get our hands on this from something like a shipwreck chest, that gives us an easy path to have 10 new unique items that just come from one single block. Things like azalea and its variants, as well as oak wood, leaves, hanging roots, rooted dirt, all of that just from one block. <laughs> not to mention that you can grind a lot of that down in a composter to also get more bone meal. Repeat the cycle, it gets pretty crazy. Stop using redstone dust in your builds, because the truth is that this is one of the lackiest redstone components in the game, especially when you continue to power it off and on. And in lieu of that, you'll find it much more efficient to use powered or activator rails instead. Which, there you go, costs the same amount of redstone. And at least for that part, it should be an easy transition to make, as long as you got a gold farm. Bone meal and saplings pair together great, but not when you're decorating trees. Since, as you'll notice from the small forest by my house, having a bunch of bone milled saplings makes for a really samey looking build. And instead, you'd be much better off by chopping down those trees and using the materials to build up some custom ones of your own. That way, you can have much more variety and you'll get a set of trees that's worthy being placed next to your beautiful house. Potions are an underrated part of Minecraft survival. And while it can definitely be a chore to have to brew these up, there's a way to cut back on that. Since by just placing a hopper over top of one of your brewing stands, we can essentially queue up a playlist of all the things that we're going to be adding into our potion. So right after the nether wart finishes, it'll put in your ingredient and then put in the modifier after that, making this cheap and efficient, both adjectives that I like. Now, there's nothing wrong with this building, but rather what it's built on, or lack thereof, because when you start to zoom back, you'll notice that part of the building is hanging off the edge of the terrain. And this just looks really amateurish. I mean, there's a reason why even Tony Stark's mansion had these giant supports keeping it to the Malibu coast. Even if gravity doesn't exist in Minecraft, you at least gotta make it look like it does. And by either adding in supports or just expanding the terrain to cover underneath your build, that'll make the whole thing look way more realistic. Never take the first horse that you tame, because while it does take a while to finally get a horse tamed and actually start using it, if that horse ends up being the slowest of the bunch, then you're gonna be wasting that time anyways. So it's worth testing out any and all horses around you and taming them to see which of them has the best stats. That way you can make sure they're not settling for some subpar steed. If you need a lot of blocks fast, dirt is a good 
go to. It's easy to dig and it doesn't burn up like leaves and other things. But you don't have to worry about getting an overpowered diamond shovel to be able to insta mine this. Since the real truth is that if you just have a stone shovel enchanted with efficiency four, that'll be fast enough to instantly mine grass, dirt, and sand. And while sure the durability is nothing to write home about, you have to remember that we're homeless, so we don't have much of a home to write back to anyway. And that could still get you plenty of dirt that you would actually need, especially for when you need to bridge in other dimensions. Or you could use that same stone shovel with that snow golem to get a lot of blocks that way. And even if your stone shovel's unenchanted, you'll still be able to instantly mine all of the snow layers at its feet to get constant snowballs for making snow blocks. Stop using your obsidian for blast chambers. Instead, use waterlogged blocks. Since 1.19 lets us now waterlog our leaves and mangrove roots, that water inside will keep these from exploding. And while this does work with any kind of waterlogged block, I would recommend using leaves instead. Since at least that way, the water's self-contained, it's not gonna flow out of the block, which could be a problem if you're using something like stairs instead. Cave vines and glow berries make for a beautiful decoration to put in your build. But as we can see from this tree on the left, it would look a lot nicer if we actually trimmed them. So if you're going through the effort of using cave vines and nether vines in your base, you'll want to also remember to pack a pair of shears to do the job right. And by clipping the ends of these, we'll make sure that our decorations never get out of hand. And hey, you can even do the same with regular vines if you add in string to keep the bottom trimmed as well. That way your Ivy League stays up in the top percentile. This redstone works, but there's still a problem with it. And as you'll see, that's because we can, well, see it. In a lot of ways, having visible redstone is a recipe for disaster. Since not only does this make all your circuitry vulnerable, but I'd also venture that whatever circuitry you got going on here does not blend well with the aesthetic you got around it. So instead, we should treat this like a maintenance closet and tuck all of our important cabling behind closed doors. Besides, if you're building a redstone casino, you're not gonna want any of your customers knowing exactly how much you're ripping them off. When you place a log facing the wrong way, it's usually easy to tell that you messed up. But when you're using the six-sided wood block, then it's a little bit more difficult. Because with this case, the texture matches on one face, but it doesn't on the other. And that's why when we look close at this building, it starts to look off, considering that some of the wooden blocks that we placed have the wrong orientation. So the next time that you're building out your log cabin, keep in mind that it's not just about the amount of wood that you have, but how you use it. XP is a valuable resource to have, so you likely want to get a lot of it. But getting a lot of XP doesn't mean that you need to build yourself an XP farm, since the simple truth is that if you head over to the nether, there's plenty of XP lying around in the floor. By just mining nether quartz ore, I think you'll find this is one of the most effective ways of gaining XP at a very high rate. And it's a lot safer than having to kill a bunch of mobs. Plus, nether quartz ore generates frequently and in pretty big veins, both of which means that you're gonna get a lot of this stuff too. So while quartz is a crafting ingredient, it might not be so useful if you're not building a house or redstone, even if you don't keep any of the item itself, I think this is still worth doing in your next playthrough. Whether you plant your sugarcane on dirt or sand, you're both wrong, since instead, you should be using mud. Odd as it sounds, the mud block is actually the best candidate for one particular reason. It's shorter than a full block size, which means that if we place hoppers underneath it, we get 100% collection efficiency. So every item that we break from our sugarcane farms can go right down to where they're supposed to be. And honestly, when the alternative is building one of these using hopper mine carts and a whole other set of hoppers, I think you'll find that just by using a few water bottles, you can get a much more efficient solution. As iCraft MC shows off, we're able to grab the big hitbox of the ghast and pull it right back down to our level. At which point, it does not take very many hits with a sword or axe to kill this thing off. And if you want to make things even easier and quicker, just put the fishing rod inside your offhand, and you can dual wield your way to victory. By using the same material for your walls, floor, and ceiling, it's tough to see the separation between the different parts of your build. And instead, you'll want to consider from the outset what's going to be your foundation, what's going to be your walls, and what's going to be your roof. Since since that allows you to break up your build and on a lot more variety to what would have just been a really monotone looking base. Copper is a great block to build your roof with, at least it is for right now. But the only issue is that over time, since we didn't wax this copper, we're going to lose that orange color that worked so well with our build in the first place. Now we do have the benefit of copper oxidizing really slowly when it's packed together like this, but slowly doesn't mean it's never going to happen. So if you're already going through the effort to mine up all the copper to do this, I'd recommend just getting another bee farm as well and preserving your build in the state you want to keep it. At. This table has one crucial flaw, and you'll notice that as soon as we start to try and set down the plates. See, when you decide to build a table using something like a bottom slab block or a bottom trap door, then we've just set ourselves up for disaster, considering that we can't place item frames or other blocks for decoration. And if you ask me, a dinner table that doesn't let you eat dinner, that's a pretty rough call. I think you'll find it's better to just build your blocks in the top part of the slab. Stop using shears to collect your leaves, but instead, you should use a hoe. No joke, because in recent versions, the hoe has gotten a much bigger bump to how you can use it. And while it does cost some extra extra experience to get the silk touch on your hoe to do this, the trade-off is that you're gonna get a much better durability than using some shears. And considering all the other blocks that we can break quickly by using this tool, I think that's more than enough reason to switch out your shears for a new side hoe. While you are technically supposed to use an axe for harvesting chorus flowers,
flowers, I wouldn't say it's the right solution, since instead, it's much easier to collect these flowers by shooting them with a bow, a trident, or even a snowball. And that also eliminates the need to go and pillar up to them, saving you time on both fronts, which I would say is a good deal. Let's face it, rails aren't cheap. So instead of spending all of your iron ingots on just getting a couple of these, I think you'll have a much better time if you just take the time to mine some of these when you're down in a mine shaft. That way we could save our iron ingots for where they actually matter. Stop building your crop farms like this, but instead, you gotta do it like this. And that's not just personal preference, but it's actually coded into the game where the crops grow faster if they're planted in rows. So to fix this problem, what you should be doing in your farms is either alternating your crop rows or leaving about one block of space in between. And no joke, because of this secret feature, you'll see an immense increase to your growth speed. And when you go to replant your next harvest, you'll want to keep that in mind. When you're living like a nomad, that usually means you're not torching up the area very much, which also means you have to deal with a lot of creepers. That is, unless you take the time to tame a cat, since by just grabbing yourself a feline friend, that'll be enough to keep all these creepers away from you. And phantoms too, which when you're not regularly sleeping in a bed, that's also very appreciated. And while sure it might take some fish to tame them initially, they're an investment that pays off, and a cheap one at that too. And luckily for us, we don't have to just settle for one pet, since by killing some of the skeletons that are given your problems and using their bones to tame wolves, we can grab just two of these and then breed them up until we have our own personal army. And since we're not getting any trouble from creepers now that we have our cat, these wolves will be able to deal with the other mobs that are giving us troubles. You just might also want to dye their collars so that you can keep track of them. Minecraft's only got the one breed of wolf, it can get pretty easy to mix them up. This house might look nice, but it's got a dirty secret. It's dirt. Dirt's the secret. And while it can be easy to fill in some of the gaps with a cheap block like dirt, all it takes is someone looking at the right angle to know that this house is built off of something pretty cheap, and that especially won't do you any favors if a creep were to explode. So for that matter, Minecraft doesn't need insulation, I'd recommend against having this. Stop using bubble columns, or rather, stop using these bubble columns, since while a soul sand bubble column could be incredibly great for getting up fast, using another one with magma blocks could be incredibly slow, and instead it's gonna be much faster and simpler for your elevator it's just to have your player fall into something that breaks their fall, like powdered snow or a water block. That way we make sure that we have the best amount of speed going both up and down. Instead of crafting a new bow every time they need a dispenser, it's worth mentioning that in recent updates, you're actually able to craft them with bows that have as little as one durability point left. And that way you can save resources and recycle those old bows that you're getting from skeletons. Here's why you need to be breaking your crops with a pickaxe. Because odd as this looks, it's actually possible to have the fortune enchantment applied when you break certain crops like carrots or potatoes. And you can see the difference in gains between these two examples. It's pretty significant. Oh, and you could also use it to get more apples from the leaves that you break. And you don't even have to use a pickaxe. This could be any tool the fortune enchantment applied. So whichever one you got on hand, that's now your farming tool. Better start using it. This bridge could be the death of me, because even though it's easy to build over the lava using netherrack, all it takes is one ghast flying by and shooting me with a fireball to completely destroy it. So even though there's a bunch of netherrack to use in the nether to build, I'd much rather prefer using something like cobblestone for a better alternative. And that way, you'll at least have a chance of surviving the fireball instead of having a definite fall to your doom. There's technically nothing wrong with this store, but when we zoom out, I'm sure you can see the problem. Because while asymmetry can be great for a build in many cases, it's when you start to have something like a two block doorway that's built into an odd numbered wall, that definitely feels like a sin. But as long as you remember to count, this is an easy one to fix, so I'm not all that worried about it. If your villagers keep escaping from your trading hall, you need to use honey blocks. Since silly as it may seem, no mob's able to jump off of a honey block to get enough height. Meaning by just tucking a couple of these inside your trading hall, your villagers won't be able to escape anytime soon. And then for some added defense, you can even add in honey blocks around them so that mobs like zombies zombies, and more importantly, baby zombies, can't even jump in to attack them, keeping them safe and in place, both of which are important. Sand is a useful resource, but digging up that sand is a tedious chore. So to solve that, don't waste your time or your shovel mining sand, since the truth of the matter is that if you just place down a single block of TNT, you can easily collect a stack or more of sand with each explosion. And especially if you happen to cross a shipwreck chest or one of the structures like a desert temple, you'll have plenty of TNT anyways. So this will be a worthwhile trade-off. It doesn't matter how nice your build is, if it has a two block tall ceiling, no one's gonna wanna come inside. Let's face it, two block tall ceilings are just annoying to get around. And without the ability to easily sprint jump between different places of the build, it's really gonna feel claustrophobic for anyone who comes inside. So if you ask me, three blocks tall should be at least the minimum. That way you'll have more room for everything you wanna do, which is quite literally gonna be less of a pain in the head. Stop worrying about getting a netherite sword, since the truth is that if you were to get yourself just three cobblestone and two sticks, you can actually deal more damage. In fact, if you give them both of them sharpness five, the stone axe will do 12 hit points per hit, whereas the netherite sword only deals 11. And while I'm not saying that an enchanting table's cheap, I will say it's a lot cheaper than a netherite sword, especially one that's also enchanted. So as long as you keep your distance from mobs and attack when your cooldown's gone down, I think you'll find this will be plenty well for you, especially in our game. Here's my big issue with
modern staircases. Because as great as the design is, the issue comes up when you start to actually try to climb it. And with these stairs, you have to jump up every single step to do it. Instead of using, I don't know, stairs, which just let you seamlessly sprint and walk up them. And really, I'm not trying to turn on auto jump just so I can climb up to my second floor. And honestly, it more so feels like this modern solution just created a couple of modern problems. I'd rather stick to the old fashioned way. If you've ever wondered why the screenshots on Reddit look so much better than your own, here's the secret. You gotta use a low FOV. Now, don't get me wrong, playing on FOV 30 is a nightmare, but when you use it for a screenshot, it gives you a much better flattening to the image. And then if you max out your render distance, you'll be able to make that shot look so much better. And then immediately turn off those settings because we actually want the game to be playable. From the front, this signpost looks fine, but once we move over to the side, then the physics start to get a bit wonky. Unfortunately, the game's coded in such a way where item frames and signs will float a little bit off of certain blocks. Those being fences, glass panes, and even chests if you look from the right angle. So if you ask me, it's worth building around this fact and considering ways that you can place these items so that there isn't an annoying gap that breaks the illusion. Or at the very least, just make sure that no one can walk over to the sides to see your problem. Finding your way back out of a cave can be tough. And while leaving a path of torches is definitely possible, that's also burning through quite a bit of the coal that you're going down there to mine in the first place. So instead, silly as it may seem, we should actually bring down a snow golem. Now, hear me out. If you tie one of these to a lead, then we can drag it along and essentially create snow layers as a path to lead us right back out of the cave. Which would be incredibly useful if you're mining so long that your pickaxe breaks down in the caves. Because while you can always dig up to get out of a cave, that's a lot tougher to do when you have nothing to dig with. And plus, the snow golem will also be able to throw off some snowballs and maybe keep some other mobs away from you down in the caves. Giving you both a getaway and a ride or die. When you've got a bed but you don't have a house, it can be tough to place it down without having monsters nearby. That is, if you're on land. Since strange as it may seem, if you take your bed and place it at the bottom of a body of water, then as long as there's no drowns nearby, you'll actually be able to sleep down there just the same. And none of the hostile mobs that were chasing you on land will be able to follow you down there. So then when you wake up and swim to the surface, you'll arrive with a whole bunch of zombies and skeletons burning in the air. Which is all the reason that you should turn your bed into a river bed, or at least place it on one. And with that folks, YouTube thinks that you might like this video. So see if they're right and have a good one, all right?